All right, guys. So today, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about UV mapping. You get a lot of um, people complaining about UVs. Oh, they're so hard, they're this and that. UVs are not that hard anymore. They used to be before all the different tools came out that we have now. So we are in Maya today. Maya's got some really nice tools. In fact, it's, it's pretty much sped up my UV workflow tremendously. So we have this creature here that I modeled. One has UVs done and one does not. So what I'm going to do is... I'm going to switch to my, where'd it go, UV editing uh, workspace here. Okay, this one here, as you can see, you know, anytime you model something, you're going to get default UVs. This is what ha what happened to end up as my default UVs. And default UVs are never useful. You, you typically can't do anything with them. Uh, if we look at the creature here, you can see that we got all kinds of weird stuff going on in here. Uh, all kinds of weird colors. That that's all. All these thick lines here, the white lines, are UV seams. So some of these polygons are sort of by themselves. That, that you can see that they're cut out completely. So what I'm gonna do is fix this, and then what we do when we're done, you know, will be something like this. Now I'm not gonna go through the whole process of getting to this point. Uh, you can pretty much figure that out after we've done, you know, one or two different parts. Okay. Now I'm, I'm using UDIMS here. I'll talk a little bit about UDIMS. It's really not that complicated. It's just the same thing you've always done working in the zero to one square, except now you can use multiple, uh, multiple uh, uh, UV tiles. Okay. I've got mine named here so you can see the numbers. The, the important number here is this 1001 uh, on all these uh, 1001. That's how they're, they're named and that's how you need to name your textures when you come to bring stuff back so that it knows where to put each texture map. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, so um, again, as you can see, this is pretty bad. All these different colors, it's, it's all based on, uh, in here, I like to turn on my shaded. By default, it's set to wireframe, so I don't get any colors, but you can see that I still do get the white seams. So when you have the UV editor open, it's going to uh, show you the seams uh, by making them a little bit thicker. Let me move myself down here real quick. There we go. Uh, okay, so that's a good way to see where your seams are. You can see I don't really have a lot of seams in the body. It's just a few things here and there. Um, but what that looks like is, is this right here. And this is absolutely useless. Uh, a lot of it comes from, you know, when you first make an object, it has default UVs. And then you go to, you know, say you start with a, a cube or cylinder. Then you go to, you know, cut more stuff in and move, push and pull and move things. Well, those UVs just keep getting worse and worse and worse as you go. Uh, and it gets to a point where they're completely unusable. You're going you, you're gonna, to, you know, sit there and then remake them. So the UVing process really begins in modeling. All right. If you're doing the modeling, you know, typically... At least as I understand it, that's that's how it goes. If you're doing the modeling, you need to have the UVs in mind, okay? Because a lot of where your UV seams are going to be is is going to be on edges that you have put there intentionally because that's where you want those seams to be. So that's one of the main things is that when you model the thing, you really got to be thinking about, you know, where your UV seams are going to be so that you have the edges to support that. Now, for this creature here, full disclosure, I'm, I created this creature in ZBrush. And it was part of a, uh, I was working on, you know, figuring out the workflow between ZBrush and Maya to, to make it a little bit better. Um, so I wanted to, now typically the workflow is you, you, you sculpt your model in ZBrush. Then you would take it into, you know, you decimate it or actually not even decimate, but you, you take the low res version of it, bring it into Maya, and then, and then retopologize over the top using stuff like, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, the modeling toolkit. Um, where is the modeling toolkit here? It's this guy. So the modeling toolkit has Quadraw. That's what I was trying to say. Quadraw is designed for retopology. Now, Quadraw is really nice in the way that it works. The problem with Quadraw is it gets real slow real fast. And even if you do um, what we call uh, uh, geometry caching, it can still get, get pretty, sl pretty slow. This creature is meant to be a high-res creature. It's not meant to be a video game creature. So, you know, poly count wise on its own, it's, it's, it's at about 41,000 faces. That, that's, that's decently high. It's not crazy high. But Quadro does tend to 
slow way down when you're dealing with, you know, something at this density of geometry. You can see it's pretty dense, right? Uh, and again, it's because it's not really meant to be a uh, game model. It's meant to be a film model. So, or, you know, film TV, that type of stuff. So I'm not worried about poly counts, but quadro tends to be slow. So I wanted to speed up my workflow um, by retopologizing in ZBrush. Uh, if you know ZBrush, you know that there's the Z remesher. Problem with Z remesher is it does the best it can, but is that geometry going to be great for animation? It all depends, uh, especially around the faces and things like that. Uh, Z remesher, you tend to have to fix up this stuff you can mess with the settings to try to get it to what you want it to be but inevitably you're going to have to do some cleanup now for me that was acceptable because i'd rather do a little bit of cleanup than have to retopologize the entire uh creature you know bit by bit you know uh, because that would have taken me longer so i'm trying to speed up my workflow so i use zero measure now you know, somewhere where the edges are, it's not the best place. So this is probably not a, not, you know, going to be perfect as far as UVing stuff. Um, but you can still get the idea. Okay. So one of the things you got to keep in mind when you're modeling things like arms, for example, like if I double click this edge loop here, you see that it just, it's a single edge loop that goes around and connects to itself. What you want to avoid is spirals, right? Uh, and it's very easy to get into this trap when you're, when you're, especially when you're doing retopology, uh, to where the edges don't connect, they just spiral up or down the arm or the leg or whatever it is. Anytime you have something that's more or less cylindrical, like an arm or a leg, right? It's, it's basically a cylinder that's, that's been shaped. Uh, you want to make sure that those edges connect. Each edge loop loops around and connects to itself. It doesn't spiral up the arm, uh, which is just going to cause you all kinds of problems. Okay, so that's one of the things you want to make sure of. Um, things like where you want that, that arm seam to be. So again, the arm is kind of a cylinder. So anytime you want to unwrap a cylinder, what you're going to have to do is decide where your seam line is going to be. Now, typically, if this was a bipedal character, you don't want that seam line to be in the inside um, of the arm because typically that arm is up against the body. If you ever see that seam, uh, you know, that's, that's the place that's typically going to be up against the body. You're never going to see it that often unless the person is running around with their arms up all the time, uh, which is fine. Um, with the different uh, texturing apps that we have, ZBrush, Substance Painter, etc., uh, seams are less of an issue than they were, you know, a decade ago, uh, where you were kind of doing it all in Photoshop and getting those seams to match up and mesh was, was you know, a crazy exercise in, in frustration. So nowadays, because you're painting right on the model, you know, having seams everywhere doesn't really doesn't really matter too much. But still, I like to think about where I'm going to put it. So I would probably put it on, on an edge like here, right? So that edge runs all the way down. Notice that it doesn't, you know, rotate around and go to the other side of the arm and things like that. you got to keep your geometry as nice as you can. Um, so that might be where I might put that seam. Now, before I start cutting my seams, you can see that th this is going to get in the way. All these extra, you know, UVs are going to get in the way. So what I like to do is to just get rid of them. And the easiest way that I've found to do that is just select your, your object here and hit it with a planar map. It doesn't matter from what axis. Uh, that's going to clean up all those, those uh, uh, seams that were there by, the, you know, the, the default seams. Notice I have not a single seam. Uh, well, except here because my neck is not merged. So let's just go ahead. I'm going to select, oops, select those and merge them. Okay. And let's hit it again just to, even though I merged them, that's, that uh, texture seam is still there. So let's just hit it again with a planar map. And that's what we have here. Now I'm going to, you'll notice here that you can see the normal, the normals are different here. That's because, um, it was two halves that were merged together. So what we're going to do is just select this. And I have all my stuff here. This is my soften normals, but the shortcut is shift, right click, soften, harden edges, and then soften edge. And then it's going to clean that up for you. Okay. Softening the normals is a trick that I use to know if I have enough geometry in my model. Right. If I do that and it looks like it kind of smoothed out, right, compared if we, if we, um, there's my channel box. If we go into our soft, edge here and set it to zero it's going to make all those faces faceted right and then so this is like each face is on its own you can see it but then if you smooth if you smooth the normals it kind of looks like it's you 
you added a smooth to it without actually increasing geometry. So that's how I gauge if I have enough geometry in my model is that it looks semi-smooth. Obviously, if you get closer, you can see that there's, you can still see some jaggedness here, but it does look like it, it's smooth and it's holding its shape. It looks good. Um, that's how I know that I have enough resolution in my model. Okay, again, I'm not doing anything for games. So for me, the higher poly counts uh, are gonna be just fine. Okay, so now we have that there. We've we've uh, given it the um, planar map. So now we get to decide where we want to put these seams. Now, I don't know how many versions ago Maya put in the 3D UV cut and sew tool. I think that's what it is. Let's go right in here. 3D cut and sew UV tool. It's kind of a long name, but um, it's kind of revolutionized the way that UVs work in Maya. Before you had to select the faces you wanted, then you hit them with a planar map. You could you could go in the UV editor, cut in cut in uh, cut in a seam, and then unfold, and that worked pretty well, right? That was a pretty nice way to work. You just you know select the faces you want, apply some kind of mapping on there, whether it's cylindrical, planar, you know whatever. Determine where the seams are by selecting edges. You select the edge loop you want to use as a seam, um, and then you would. Uh, uh, and if we go here in the in the unfold, then you would just hit unfold and it'll open it up, and it was it was pretty fast. So that was all well and good. Then they came out with this 3D so see now now it's messed me up. 3D cut and sew UV tool, and all you got to do is once you've cleaned it up and gotten rid of the seams of the default seams that you don't want, all you got to do now is just tell it what tell it what the seams are that you do want. So I'm going to select that tool, and you say you know it'll tell you, you can drag. Uh, a seam, I, I find that doesn't work very well. Like for example, if I wanted to just cut straight down here, you'll see that it'll some, sometimes kick off if I'm not perfect with my mouse and I get things like this, which I then have to, to, to deal with. Um, so I prefer, rather than dragging, like if I wanted to cut a seam, I'm gonna click on the first edge and then say, let's see, this goes to here, let, and then shift, double click, and it's gonna cut a seam between there. That's just my personal preference. Um, if we, Again, if we go in the tool settings, if you want to know what this tool does, all the different shortcuts, if you select it and then come in here, keyboard mouse shortcuts, it's going to tell you all that stuff. Okay, so all these things are uh, useful. Um, I use some, don't use all of them. Uh, the main thing is if you want to create a seam, you can just, you know, again, like I did, cl click on one and shift, double click at the end, and it'll, it'll uh, cut a seam between those two edges that you selected so the other way now cutting the first seam you'll see that if I do that you see if I just click it's not gonna cut the seam right it's just gonna select the edge um, and maybe I'm, I'm not using this right or whatever but if and then if you try to double click it's gonna if you just double click one edge it's gonna go around the whole thing and follow that edge loop till it can't anymore so typically that's not what you want um, so to, to, start this, to start a seam where, where there isn't any, I'm just going to click on one and then shift double click the one next to it. And then from there, as you click on an edge that is connected to that seam, it will. And sometimes you got to click twice, but not double click. Just click. It's kind of weird. I, I wish they would make this a little bit uh, more intuitive how this works. But if you click on an edge that is connected to an already cut seam, it'll cut in a new edge. So I'm just clicking like this and you can see but if I click where it's not touching an edge it's not going to create a seam okay so that's kind of the uh, thing that you got to deal with and I kind of like that if you change your mind you want to maybe you don't want this to be part of the seam you control click on it and sometimes again you gotta click more than once or get in closer um, it can be a little finicky and also, say I want to get rid of these three right here. I could just hold down Control, double click them, and it's going to get rid of those. It'll follow the edge loop, edge loop until it stops. So again, here if I Control, double click, it's going to deselect the entire edge loop. So Control, double clicking will deselect. It'll follow the edge loop, edge loop of seams, and get rid of all those those uh, seams. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Now, so say we want to do this arm here. Now you know this this deltoid here kind of connects and again you know some of this geometry is not probably what I would have done myself uh, but Z Ramesh did it it didn't a good enough job for me that I wasn't gonna sit there and try to fix it the things that I did need to fix were like the the uh, the elbows to get that nice geometry in there uh, especially this one here you can see this is what I cut in here just to give me more geometry same here with the legs 
I had to cut in some of this stuff. So there was a little bit of cleanup done, but overall it took me less time than if I sat there and retopologized it from, from scratch. So there's, there's some workflow things to, to, uh, to, to be had there. It worked pretty well. Um, I still need to tweak it a little bit to get a workflow that works for me. So if we, again, if I double click here, notice that this, it'll stop here. It'll go to here and then stop here as well. And the reason is, is because I have this pole here, right? A pole being a, a, a point that has five or more uh, faces connected to it. It causes a star, sometimes called a five star, but you can have more than five sites. Um, so it'll stop there because it doesn't know which way to go. It could go this way or it could go up, up this way. It could even go that way. So because, it, because it's not obvious where it has to go, it stops. And that's actually a really nice feature because I know it's going to stop here. So if I double click here, it's going to stop right there, right? So uh, that's actually a good way to uh, create your seams. So now here, again, because I didn't do this myself, some of these don't flow as nicely as I might like, but that's all right. Now, if I double click, you know, I, I run the risk of things going haywire. So I like to, you know, I might click on one, so click there and then say I only want it to go to here. I just, you know, I like to do it that way better. So what I'm trying to do is sort of outline this, this arm here. Um, and even if my geometry might not be the nicest, I'm going to see what I can get out of it here. So let's go here. And again, you know, I, I started 3D in a time where we didn't have any of these unfold tools or anything like that. You you had to sit there and move, push and pull UVs, which was an absolute nightmare. And I absolutely hated UVs at that point. So, you know, we have a little bit better now that we don't have to do that. We can we can have it sort of be automated um, quite a bit. So as you can see, I'm just click. So I like to use the select, you know, cut a range of seams. I prefer that because it, it, it gives me much, uh, much better results. So I'm going to, you know, go from here and this would run all the way around to here. Right. Uh, and I'm just going to see how I can. So I might even just connect this to here. Now, what you'll notice is that if there's an, if there's already an established seam, if I double click here, it's going to stop when it hits a seam versus if I, you know, double click here, it's just going to go until it can't go anymore. Right. It's, it's going to stop here at the five star and then loop around on itself. But if it's running into a seam, so if I double click here, it's, it's going to stop here. It's going to go that way and it's going to stop there. If I had, say, a seam running here and then I double click, notice that it only will cut there. That's a really nice feature because sometimes, you know, if you double click, you know, sometimes it over selects a lot and you, you got to go back in and start hitting control uh, to try to deselect. Uh, and by the way, control deselect does not work the same way where you can, you know, maybe control click one and then double control click another. It doesn't really work that way. It just does the entire edge loop. So that that's that's one of those things that doesn't work the way that you would expect. So Let's get rid of this. So I'm just going to bring this around here and connect here. And that means then I can just use control to clean that up. Remember, you don't want to leave seams that you don't want. Okay. So we have now outlined the top of this arm. Now an arm, of course, is going to run down to the wrist. And, you know, somewhere on the wrist here, I'm just going to double click to select that entire edge loop. Okay. So that's what we have. And then I need a seam up the arm, which again... I like to have on the inside of the arm. So let's go and maybe double click like that, right? So now what I can do, and you know, there's, there's different ways. You can unfold, every time you get a, a completed unit, you can unfold it, move it aside and do the rest. Or you can just cut all your seams and then unfold the whole thing at once. Um, since we're not gonna go through this entire creature, it, it'd take a little too long here. Uh, I'm gonna do this now that I've, I've laid out all the seams for my, for my arm. And now I just want to unfold that arm on its own. So what I can do still within this tool, 3D UV cut sew tool, if I right click and go to component and go to UV shell, notice that when I hover over here, it'll select just that arm because I have defined the UV shell by all the edges. Okay. I have, I have an edge loop that completely cuts off around the shoulder and then I have another edge loop that completely cuts off around the wrist. So between those two completed edge loops, if I left a, a, a gap between there, 
obviously this one works. So if I click on it, it's going to select just that UV shell. And I have, I have uh, symmetry on, by the way, right? If you come in here, set on uh, object X, it'll do both sides of the creature. Okay, and I would recommend if you're if you're whatever it is you're UVing is symmetrical, save yourself the work of doing it twice. Just put on the symmetry, uh, and, and and it'll it'll cut both sides at the same time. So with that selected, what I can do now, and again if we come here into the uh, the the shortcuts here, you'll see that D will unfold the highlighted UV shell and then lay them out. If you do Shift D, uh, it'll just simply unfold it without laying it out. It doesn't really matter. Um, I just use, use D because it's, it's less buttons to push because eventually I'm going to get all these UV shells to match up in, in proportion or texel density. And, and then I'm going to lay them out on my different things because when it lays it out, it's always going to lay it out in a zero to one square. Um, and there's ways to get it to lay out over multiple, uh, UV tiles, but it's never the way that you want. So really, I don't care. All, all I care about right now is it being unfolded. So with that selected, if I hit D and you got to make sure that your mouse is in the in the viewport, it's going to take those two arms and unfold them, as you can see. OK, so pretty simple. Notice that they're, you know, one is is angled or whatever. Not a big deal. Um, if I go here to UV and and, you know, I might have to turn off my symmetry here. Select that. Uh, let's go in the UV toolkit. And sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. If you hit straighten shell, it's, it's going to give me an error because I'm not in UV mode, which is kind of annoying. So you got to go to UV mode. Uh, now, the, the problem is, so let's let's go back here. Right now, I have my UV shell selected as faces. If I, and I got to remember the shortcut here, it's shift right click. And is it shift right click? Control right click. And then go to UVs to UVs. It's going to convert that selection to a UV selection. Okay, so... If I straighten the UVs, sometimes it'll straighten it, sometimes it won't. Oh, you know what? That was the wrong one. It should have been straightened shell. Now what it's going to do is try to get all the, the UVs in straight lines, and it's going to take way longer. See if I can escape out of that. That's actually a, a tool that I, I don't like uh, because, it, you know, if it, if it changes the layout of your UVs, it's, it's going to be stretching your textures. So hopefully it won't take too long and won't crash because I haven't saved anything. Um, but I'll wait for it here. I'm not going to make you wait. So I'm going to pause the video real quick and I'll be back. All right. As you can see, that is complete trash, right? It just took my edge loops and it tried to straighten them either on the vertical or the horizontal and it even didn't, it missed some of these. So obviously I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not sure why you'd use that. At least maybe not on organic, maybe on more hard surface stuff that might be useful, but I have not found a use for it yet. So the one I want is straightened shell. So I'm just going to undo this. And hope it doesn't take a week again. Um, and, you know, I really should have saved before I did that. So some of these operations, being as intensive as they are, can crash my ISO. If you know that, it might be, uh, it might be a good idea to save. Okay, we're good. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and save right now just to, <laughs> to make sure we don't run into problems. So straighten shell will sometimes work. So it did a, did a halfway decent job. Honestly, it doesn't matter. Right. Because when it comes down to it, we're not painting textures in Photoshop anymore. Um, the only reason I might straighten a shell is just to make it so it fits, you know, with the other shells. OK. And I could have just done that by just just selecting everything and just rotating it myself anyway. So it's almost not worth it. But sometimes it, it, I will use that. So there we go. The arms. Oops. My move tool. I'm just going to move them out of the way here. Now, you'll notice that there is a little bit of lag here. And again, it's because my my creature here has a decent. Uh, poly count again 41,000 which may not seem like a lot but um, for some of these operations that we're doing here it, it can uh, slow down um, let's see if I do it in you yeah it's the you know so they're they're relatively heavy you can see they're pretty dense and you know with geometry so you you kind of have to decide for yourself um, how dense your, your modeling is going to be um, I like to work at more sort of movie at least aim for movie quality so I tend to like working at a, at a much higher poly count for my uh, meshes. All right, so let's let's do another arm here real quick. So select the tool here and decide where I want. Now I have this little bit of uh, webbing here that I put in, um, and I got to decide if, if I want to include that with the arm because as you can see, if I just double click here, you can see that this seam is going to cut this webbing in half. Um, I think on the other one, I actually included it so I can go to here and then here. 
or something like that. Um, see how we want to do this here. Let's let's come around here. See where we want to chop this arm. Um, and you notice that this this creature, of course, is is female with the breasts here. So those obviously complicate matters, especially because there's four of them now. Um, but we'll we'll work it here. So let's. I'm just gonna look and see what is going to work the best for me. So maybe here, and maybe this one. I'm trying to see what uh, edge loop is coming around here, because this is a very logical edge loop here. And again, if I hadn't done this with zebra mesher, these might be a little bit. So say from here we go to here. As you can see, that's not going to, I want it to connect into here. So what I can do actually is just undo that. Let's go. Well, you know what? Let's, let's go. Let's do that again. And say we wanted to connect here. So I'm just going to click. See, sometimes it doesn't work. There we go. And sometimes you just got to get the right angle on it. I don't want to double click it. See, and if it doesn't work, just click on one. Oh, now it worked. And then just double click another one. So, you know. So I'm going to run across here again. So sometimes it will run past if it's if it's going across. Um, so we'll just click, maybe. Yeah, sometimes. So some of the selection with this tool is really dicey. So you can see it's not even really select. There we go. So I don't know if there's a trick to that that I'm missing or what. Uh, but yeah. So again, you you'd want to as you're modeling, you'd want to make those seams, those edge edge loops flow a little better. So you got to really be thinking about this stuff. Um, zero mesher does an okay job. You know, overall the mesh is fine uh, for what I wanted it for. But my OCD is like, ah, why didn't I, you know, you know, model that a little bit tighter? And that's okay. You know, it's okay to be a bit of a perfectionist, um, but don't go crazy with it. All right. So let's see where we're gonna go this side. Uh, and for those of you that, that don't use a zero mesher, if you do work in ZBrush, zero mesher will save you a lot of time. You just got to learn how to how to work it so that it does, you know, what you want it to do. So let's see here. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And the reason I want to, I just want to cut this webbing out here because the back muscles sort of come to here. So it's kind of a natural seam between the you know, muscly area and the, the, the skin of the webbing here. So I figured that might be a good place to create a seam. Um, but again, it's, it's always going to be up to you how you want to do that. Uh, let's see here. So I could run this here, which is not the prettiest, but I can make it work. All right, so a lot of it too is I'm, I'm trying to get out of that perfectionist mindset because it can slow you down a little bit, right? So you you got to... You gotta know where where when it's okay to stop being a perfectionist and when when you want to push and be a perfectionist, um, because if you're in a production pipeline, sort of in a in in a big production, you, you know you, you don't have time to to get every little thing that you want. You gotta you gotta get the thing built and and sent out. So you gotta you and you you figure this out if you work in a production like that. You you learn what's good enough and what isn't. Um, so for my purposes, this was fine. So again, here now that we've gone around there again i'm the wrist i'm gonna just double click one of these which one is entirely you know up to you and then what i want is the the inner seam here so you know maybe let's try this one and that's not bad uh yeah let's go with this one okay so that's going to connect this so then again right click component uv shell click on that to uh Oh, and you know, I turned my symmetry off. So this is this is one of those things that if you if you turn your symmetry off, uh, oh, you know what? Well, yeah. Now that I've selected the faces, it's going to select those faces, but they're not cut out here. So I turned the symmetry off when I was messing with the UVs. So that there's a lesson right there. Finish up cutting the seams. You can unfold stuff, but don't worry about rotating stuff till later because that that's that's for later. Because if you turn off the, the symmetry and then forget, now you're in this situation that I'm in here. Um, so what I can do, I guess I can go back in and go to edge again and, and uh, just re... I think if I re-double click some of these... Yeah, no, it's not going to work. Actually, you know what? It looks like... 
Is that correct? Oh, okay. Apparently, if you double-click a seam, so I'm learning stuff too. Apparently, if you double-click a seam after you turn the symmetry on, it'll just reselect that entire group of seams. That is really good to know. Okay, so there we go. We learned something. Okay, so right-click component UV shell. Click there, hit D, and it's going. Oh, that's that's the ones I'd already done. So you see, I'm I'm losing my mind here. That was the wrong one. Okay, good lord. All right, let's go back again, back again to, I was looking at the raw, I was looking at the front arms, I was supposed to be looking at these. So yeah, I gotta go in and, yeah, no, that's not gonna work. Okay, so let's, let's. Uh, I'm not gonna re-record this, so it is what it is. Uh, you'll see my blunders and that's fine. Um, let's assume that I did the other side, okay? Uh, let's assume that I had remembered to use the symmetry on there and uh, so that it would select them both. But Okay, component, UV shell, select. And now I have to turn symmetry off because if I try to unfold it now with no seams, it's, it's going to cause real issues on this side. So uh, I'm just going to deselect that side. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hit D and it's going to go through somewhere. There it is. And it's going to unfold that arm. Okay, now I like to check uh, I'm going to go into object mode here, get out of that tool. I like to check what my, uh, you know, how well unfolded things are. Remember that unfolding, really what you're doing is you're taking a three-dimensional object and figuring out where to cut it to lay it out as flat as you can. So with any three-dimensional object, you'll never be able to lay it down perfectly flat. Unless it's something like clothes, which are made from flat patterns. But if you take somebody's head, there's no way no matter what you do, that it's going to be a perfectly flattened object, right? Because it just doesn't work that way. So there's going to be stretching somewhere. You want to check on it, see where that is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply my own checker map. Now, there is a checker map that I can use right here. And it works fine. I don't really like it because I like to, to um, determine the size of the squares. And, you know, there may be a setting somewhere where you can do that. And I hate that it disappears after you deselect. That's one of the things, that's one of the reasons I don't like to use this one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this off in the UV editor. I'm just going to right click and assign a new material, uh, you know, like a Lambert. I don't need anything shiny here. I'm going to go till I find that lab. Now all my cuts here are in there. So if I go in my channel box, you'll see that I'm starting to build history. And that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, Quadro will slow down on use the history. But even if you turn off history, which is this button right here, it still does bogged down. So that's one of the that's one of the things with Quadro. And my system is not a slouch. I got two uh, 2080 Ti's in here. I have a 128 gigs of RAM. I have uh, 32 core AMD processor, which multi-threads to 64. So this is not a, a crappy computer. This is a pretty, you know, beefy system. Uh, yeah, it's still using the, the 2000 series uh, cars but there's you know the 2080 ti's were the top of the line for the last generation and i have two of them in here not that that helps i don't think maya in the viewport uses both video cards which is kind of annoying and neither does arnold for rendering which is incredibly annoying um but this computer is no slouch and it, it still bogs down pretty easily so from time to time i'm just going to delete history alt shift d just to get rid of that history as you can see, it's gone now, just to speed things up a little bit. Okay, so we have that laid out. So again, so I've, I've applied that uh, new Lambert on there. You can name it. I'm just going to keep going here. I'm going to go here in color, and I'm going to put a checker map in here. Then I'm going to hit 6 in the viewport so we can see the checker map. So you can see uh, what it's looking like. Uh, my squares are a little bit big. Okay, and again, this is why I like to have control over the size of the squares. So the easy way to fix that is just go into the color of your Lambert, and up here is a place to texture node, and the place to texture node determines, you know, your tiling and stuff. If we click on it, you can rotate your images or whatever you need to do. Uh, repeat UV is the tiling. So how many times is that checker map repeating? Default is four. I'm going to go to 50 by, oops, 50 by 50, okay? So what that gives me now is much smaller squares, and I can see that there is stretching, right? Um, and that's okay because really there's not much you're going to be able to do about that. What you can try to do uh, is, is come in here, get in the UV toolkit, and I'm going to right click, go to UV shell, click on this UV shell, and I'm going to use optimize. Now notice here we got some edges that are pretty tight. 
Uh, unfold does the best it, it can. If you hit optimize, you'll see what, what happened there. And, I, and you got to keep hitting it. Now, you can go in the settings and, and tell it how many iterations to do, which I believe is under tools. Go to optimize. So uh, the strength of it, you can increase the strength of whatnot. Uh, I, li I just leave it a default. If I keep hitting on it, you'll see that this thing, it tries really hard to straighten, out, straighten itself out even more. Right. So if I keep doing that, notice that my stretching in my arm is getting a little bit better. It's getting a little bit better, but it's it's not getting removed completely. So what I tend to do is I, I'll keep hitting this until I see very little or no more movement. OK, so we're going to keep doing that. And let's see. And this might take a while, so I'm not going to I'm not going to bore you with it. I'm just going to hit it a few more times. Now, be careful with really just rapidly clicking on it because it's got to finish the calculations of each one before it does the next and if you did it like 50 really rapid clicks you're going to have to wait for it to be done okay so be very careful with that uh let's hit it one more time see if we get anything else we get a little yeah we're not getting anything any more movement here so that's as optimized as it's going to be notice that it it kind of bent it a little bit um now you might say you know, is it messing it up? It's actually not. It's trying to get it to to conform as, as much to its shape, uh, to to as as flat as you can lay it out, in order to give you the least amount of stretching. So now we, you know, this is a bit, a bit better. I'm seeing way less stretching in here. Um, but my squares, you know, the, the the thing that you're looking for is the squares to be as square as possible, but also be about the same size, right? Um, now they're not going to be perfect. You can see in the edges, in the areas with the most stretchy, you're going to get, you know, the most enlarging or, or shrinking of, uh, of, of the squares. Okay. And then the areas that have the least amount of stretching, again, you're almost going to get perfect squares because that forearm looks like it unfolded almost perfectly. You're right. So these squares are almost perfectly square. There's a little bit of rectangulation here. Um, but it's, it's, it, it's, it's not bad at all. Let's look at the other arms that we had here. We didn't we didn't optimize these, um, and I'm gonna get out of my tool here. Right click UV shell, click on one of these. Now I'm gonna do them one at a time because if I try to do them at the same time, that's when things start to bog down again. So I'm gonna hit optimize, and we're just gonna watch what happens as I optimize. You see, it's gonna. I'll hit it a few times. I don't mind if it, you know, two or three. I'm, I'm not gonna do more than two or three clicks at a time because I, I don't want it to, to start to bog down too much. Okay, so I'm just gonna hit that. And if you're watching the UVs, you'll see it, you'll see movement there too, right? It's really trying to pull as much of the stretching out of it as it can. Okay, so again, this is almost like black magic to me, having started a time before uh, Maya had any of this stuff. I started Maya version two, I think it was called. It was still owned by, uh, uh, alias Wavefront. It was Alias Maya. Um, whole different time back then. Whole different time. UV mapping was the absolute worst part of the 3D process. Worse than animation. I freaking hate animation, but UV mapping was 10 times worse. Uh, now with these things, it, it pretty much does it for you. All, I, all I'm really doing here is determining where the seams are, and then it's unfolding it for me. Uh, you know, that's, that's pretty crazy. Before, what we had to do is just do planar maps and then try to stitch them together because planar maps were, were flat. Um, you'd select the faces, planar map. Uh, yeah, it, it was a whole thing. So, you know, things are a lot better now. So that's about as good as I'm going to get. And this is good enough, right? If you're painting in something like ZBrush, this is good enough. Uh, before, we used to have to go into, into uh, Photoshop for the texturing. That was another nightmare. Be happy you got substance and those, those types of things. So let's assume that we had now gone through the whole creature and gotten all this unfolded. Um, the squares right now, you can see a different sizes on, on the, back, the, the back arm and the front arm, okay? And that's because they're not at what we call the same textile density. Now, before we get into that, one thing I like to do here, again, is I like to go here and turn on shaded, or shortcut is five. And what this does is it, if, if the UV shells are blue, it tells me that they are facing up means they're not upside down. So what does that look like? So if I was to take this shell and just go up here to transform and just, I'm going to, where is it here? I'm going to flip it in the U direction, which is on the X axis. Notice that it's now, it's now red. So that is a good way for you to, to determine that your shells are the right way up. They're not upside down. Um, 
And why is this important? At the end of the day, if I was, if I was just going to texture skin texture on that, it's not going to matter, right? But say it was something that had text going along it. And if I go to, you know, say, say I did in Photoshop. If I went in Photoshop and I laid text ac across here, it would be backward on the mesh because the, the, the UVs are upside down. So that's why, that's why it's important. Now, the nice thing about it is anytime you use one of the built-in unfolds, It'll, it'll flip it the right way up for you. So you almost don't have to think about it, but I like to, I like to have that visible so I can be sure that everything is blue. So I'm just gonna undo and get that back to where, where it was. So textile density. Um, you know, before we go into that, I'm just gonna hit five to get out of this. I'm just gonna cut my back here. Um, now my neck here. So again, the neck is more of a cylinder. So typically with a human neck, you just cut across here. Now, what, what's happened here is because the way this creature is, is sort of postured, uh, Z remesher, you know, had I done this myself, I'd have probably had edge loops running across this way on the neck just to make things easier. So now it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, there's not an even flow here. Again, not a big deal. We'll make it work. Um, say I want to, I like to split the chest and the back. Some people like to leave them connected. Um, but I like to split them up here. So I'm going to determine where, you know, where I would lay out the legs. So that'd be somewhere here. And then I can, you know, for my back here, I can, you know, maybe, maybe one of these here. So that'll connect there. And, you know, I'm going to undo that because again, my symmetry is off. Let's turn symmetry on. So again, let's say this guy would have been where the, the legs are and there to there. And of course, my edges here because of not having symmetry so we're going to go up to from here Come on, there and then we're going to go here i'm just going to do this top part just to separate the back and i went something like that so yeah That'll be so now we got to determine how we're going to split this from the head. So let's just go here to here and then cut one in here and then just double click. So you can see just how quick this can be. Okay, now in the back here, I hope you're not offended by monster nudity. Uh, say I just want to cut a seam across, let's just make it easy. So the nice thing about having my shader turned on is when I'm using this tool, anytime I separate a shell, any, anytime, so if I, if I undo here, you'll see that before I made that last cut, it's still the same color as the legs, but the two arms, or the, you know, the, the arms are different colors um, because they're separate shells. So if we go again into view, shaded, go in the options, you'll notice that there's, there's two different uh, settings here. Color mode uh, is multicolor or front and back facing. So before I was using front and back facing where it's either blue or red, but when you go into the 3D UV cut and sew tool, it automatically switches to multicolor so that anytime you complete an edge uh, a UV shell, oops, anytime you complete a UV shell, so if I double click, you'll notice that it changed color to let me know that I have now separated the shell. Very nice feature, really helps to speed things along. So now that we have a completed shell, right click, go to component, UV shell, click on this, hit D. And I really should have been down here. Let's do that again. So I'm over here, hit D, and you'll see it open up, opens up really nicely. Go into object mode, get out of this tool. You got to remember to get out of the tool. I just usually hit Q to activate the selection tool because if you're in this tool and messing around in here, some of the commands are going to be different. So um, I like to get out of there. So I'm going to hit six to turn my textures back on and notice that my back is now nicely laid out. But again, the squares need to match. So back in the day, we would use the checker maps like this and then we'd sort of eyeball it, right? So for example, um, I could take my back here and start to scale it to, to see, and you'd eyeball it to see how, you know, are the squares on the arm more or less the same size? You know, that worked, but it wasn't perfect. Um, so nowadays you don't have to do that. Nowadays it's really easy um, in that you can do use what we call textile density. So under the transform menu, we have a textile density. Now, I, I forget what the default map size is for, for what I'm doing here, the map size doesn't matter. I just set it to 4K because typically I'm doing 4K textures. It's going to affect 
uh, some of the layout things that we have, it's going to affect that, but really it doesn't really matter. The number that you get, so if I say uh, select my back piece and I go to get, it's going to tell me what the texel density for the back is. The, the actual number is not important. Now, you know, again, I don't work in games, so I don't know if that is an important number or not. Maybe in the games it, it means something. Um, all I'm using that number for is to make sure that all the other things are using the same number so that they match. So now if I select this arm and that arm, um, and again, because I did not do the seams on this side, we're going to have issues. So I'm going to turn off my symmetry here and just deselect the, the faces on this side so I'm not not going through hell here. Okay, so select all those, those shells. And now because that texel density down there was set to 54 point whatever again i'm going to set for these shells here notice that the arms got bigger the big arms got bigger the small arm got a little bit smaller but notice now that they're at the same texel density these squares are now the same across the board okay this is very important because for example this creature you know ends up with a bunch of you know skin texture and whatnot so what that means is uh if I do skin pores and, and you know, skin texture on one piece, it's got to be the same size, the same proportion on all the other pieces because they're part of the same creature, right? Before this, if I had this arm and it was, you know, like that in the wrong texel density, well, my skin texture is not going to match. I'm going to get it real big on the, on the arm here. It's going to be real, you know, small on the back. And that's obviously going to stick out. Plus, that'll, that'll bring attention to the seam. So... We use the textile density to make sure that these things match up for, for textures like that. Um, and then the other thing about textile density. So this is my back here. Now you can see that it barely fits inside a UV square. So whatever the biggest chunk is, whatever the biggest piece of your model is, kind of by default sets the textile density for everything else. Because, for example, if this thing was, if it unfolded and it was this big, so let's get this new textile density. So 124. So at this textile density, it's not going to fit in a UV cube, a UV square, right? It's not going to fit in, in a single square. So it can't be at that textile density. So I have to shrink it down to where, you know, if I want to use as much UV space as possible, I'm going to shrink it down to just about where it fits uh, and I want to give enough room to the edges of the, the uh, texture boundary. If I have it so close, you know, within a pixel or whatever, this can sometimes cause issues with bleeding, color bleeding from, uh, you know, at the edges there. Uh, so I tend to just, just, you know, bring it in here a little bit, just so it's not too far. And the same goes for, for UV shells that are next to each other. Obviously, you don't want them overlapping, but you don't want to be so close that they're almost touching like that, right? You, you, don't, you don't want it to be this close. because Sometimes you will get colors bleeding from one to the other, um, especially in things like substance. So you want to give them a little bit of room, right? And then also within the, say these two are going to be on the same UV shell, you know, you'd want to give them enough room. But again, the biggest piece, which right now would be the, the back here, is going to determine the textile density for everything else. So at, at this point, size here if i get the textile density it should be in the 40 there we go 45 so now by default these things have to be at 45 as well right so i select these two and i just hit set and they're they're yeah pretty much there already so now they fit okay so sometimes what will happen so if i select this one and set it to 45 you'll see that now it's gonna you know it's not gonna be as big in the uv square and that's natural right because this arm is smaller than this this arm so it's the, if you're going to keep them in the same textile density, it's going to be smaller in the UV uh, editor as well. I wouldn't want to scale this up just to maximize my uh, just to maximize my textures, unless and this is where the map size can be useful. If I want to make this twice as big, I can use a map that's half the size. So this map could end up being 4K, um, and this map could end up being 2K. So, but I, you know, again, I don't, I don't like to play those games. It just overcomplicates things. I'll just put the other arm in here and whatever else I can fit in the, in the, uh, in the UV set here. Okay. So 
um, you know, that, that uh, textile density is, is pretty important, right? You want to make sure things are in proportion to each other. And that's usually for things that are using the same material. Because this character's body is going to be one material, you, you want that textile density to match across the whole thing. You know, he's got teeth and whatnot. Those can be their own textile density as, as, as needed. So you don't, you know, they don't necessarily have to be. If you're doing a robot that has body panels that use the same paint, but then, you know, maybe some of the, you know, the arm parts are completely different material, then those arm parts could be some other textile density. Uh, and then the body panels that use the same paint has that have maybe have text on them, whatever, those could be the same textile density. So it's not that every single thing needs to have the same textile density. It's usually the, the parts that are using the same material that should have the te same textile density. But having said that, the other thing you got to think about is if, for example, so this is this is a, this is kind of a creature here that is, uh, uh, you know, maybe he's, he's eating somebody and you got. You know, he gets splashed with blood on the mouth. That blood texture, right, if it stains the skin and also stains the teeth, you, you want the, the blood droplets to be at the same textile density. So then you would have to make the teeth and the body the same textile density. So when you splash the blood across those two things, the skin and into the mouth and teeth, it matches up. So it's not like pixelated on the teeth, but, you know, a nice detail on the... On, on the body. So it all depends. If you're going to get crossover like that, then yes, make everything the same textile density. If you're not, don't worry about it. Okay. So that is sort of the gist here. Now, the other thing we could do, because we are working with UDIMs these days, if I really want to get a good resolution, right? Now, you know, we, we got what, 8, 8K TVs now? I don't. Mine is 4K. But even a 4K TV shows a lot of detail. So even at 4K, if this ends up being a 4K map, maybe it's not enough detail so what we can do is just again get the 3d uv cut and sew tool you know figure out where you know center line is i don't know maybe here and again you can you can do this right in the let's do this one you can do this in the uv editor or the viewport i'm just going to double click here so now i'll split this i've created a seam that before i would have never done this if i was working in photoshop i'd have never created a seam like this where it's not really necessary okay but because we're doing, you know, painting in ZBrush or Substance, and I like ZBrush for more organic stuff, and, you know, I'll probably show the texture later. Um, I like ZBrush for organic stuff. I can paint over the seam, but you'll never know it's there. So this then, now that I've split the back in two, it's, you know, I can now set this to be on a single tile, and whatever I've scaled that to now, I got to get that textile density, select this one, and set the textile density so they're at the same size. And you can see that, uh, what, what happened there? We have a little overlap here over the border. And that's one of the things, and Substance will not import the model if you have UVs that are overlapping the border. So it seems that this piece is a little bit, a little bit bigger than the other one. So what I got to do here is, because this is now the biggest piece, I'm going to scale it down to right about you know where I want it to be and again I'm, I'm, I'm trying real hard not to be too close to the edges I'm gonna get that textile density which is at 78 and I'm gonna apply 78 to this guy which is gonna shrink it down right it's not gonna use up as much of the texture space as I might like and that's okay and there we go so now that becomes a new textile density if I now set my arms let's just select all these if I now set those to the same textile density now obviously they're too big and I can do the same thing again. I can now, uh, let's see, get my 3D cut and sew tool here. And maybe right in the elbow. Let's go into edge mode, component edge. Just double click there to, you know, determine where I want my split to be. And, you, you know, you, you'll figure out where you want to cut it. And again, I, you know, this, this uh, symmetry thing that I forgot to do. Let's see, which edge is it? Let's just turn symmetry back on. And I'm just going to double click this again. And it's going to go around. There we go. Okay, so now, now I've split these. And we know that we set the textile density to match these. So these are already at the correct textile density. So now I might split these. So here, so let's, so, so you see why I turn off symmetry because now I can't select just one. It's going to select both of the shells. So I have to turn it off. 
Uh, I'm not sure if there's a better way to do that. So now this guy's gonna live in one UDIM. This guy's gonna live in another. This one here. And let's see if I can fit both of these. So I'm just gonna rotate this 180 degrees, see if I can fit them in here. Right, so, so you know, sometimes you'll have opportunities to do that. And they are at the same textile density, so that's fine. You gotta be, you, you gotta try to be as efficient with your texture space as possible. Now this one at this new textile density is, is a little big as well, barely. So what I can do is just rotate it this way, and now it just lives in its own UDIM. Okay, these are the default, sort of the, the, those planar map UVs that I did before. So I'm just going to just move these out of the way. So as, as I, you know, cut new seams and lay out things, this is going to just get less and less and less until it's all gone. So one thing you got to keep in mind about UVs that I've been told you need to do is always make sure the 1001, the 0 to 1 square, always has something. So whatever that is, doesn't matter which, which one it is, but this always should have something. Um, and, you know, just as a rule of thumb, I don't think this is, this is you know, a rule, you know, you have to do it this way. But I like to make it so that my UDIMs sort of flow. I don't, I don't want gaps in my UDIMs, right? I don't want to do that. Um, because sometimes, especially if you go to, uh, you know, if you, if you are going to go to, to uh, Photoshop and do this stuff, you can tell it what the tile range is, and it'll, it'll export the, the UVs. But it's using the range, so that empty one is going to have an image created even though it's empty. At least I, I believe that's how that works. So I try not to have any gaps. Um, and you can have as many tiles as you want as long as you do not cross into the negative number. So that means this upper right quadrant of this uh, grid is the only one you can use. Don't put anything in these. These I, I put over here just because they're temporary. Uh, and you can do that with the temporary stuff. But when you're all said and done, you want it all to be in this upper right quadrant. It, the, the U values are positive and the V values are positive. That's what you want. Do not put your U dims in any of the negative ones. And you can have as many as you want. You know, I've heard, you know, I, I guess in, in the movie industry, they, they can have hundreds of U dims on a single, uh, on a single creature or whatever. So, you know, I, I don't work at that crazy level because... The more UDIMs you have, the, the, the slower things are going to end up being when you get into substance and things like that. If you want to work with large numbers of UDIMs, I, I believe Mari is the tool to use. Um, but, you know, I've, I use up to 12, up to 18, up to 20. For me, that's enough at 4K a piece. Uh, if you're going to go into, the, you know, the 30, 40, 50 UDIMs, then you might want to think about going down to 2K because that's a lot of imagery. Um, and typically, we don't use 8K. You can do it. I don't recommend it because an 8K image is really intensive on the computer. And if you got a UDIM set that has, you know, 10 or 20 at 8K, it'll probably crash your system, okay? So, you know, there, there's so this idea that having, if you need a lot of UDIMs, knock them down to something like 2K because 2K maps read fast. So a lot of 2K maps is a little bit better than, you know, a certain number of, say, 4K maps, and it's way better than using 8K maps. So it all depends on how close, you know, you got to if you're going to use this in an animation or something, you got to think about how close they're going to get to camera. If it's going to be right up on camera, then you're going to have to really, you know, you know, the, you know, this, how we split the back might not be enough. You might want to split it again and, and enlarge those even more and use the UDIMs. That's the nice thing about the UDIMs, right? Before you had to cram everything into the zero to one or the 1001. And then to get more resolution, you had to increase the texture size. So 4K, 8K. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, I don't know if Maya does use anything greater than 8K. Um, and in this day and age of 4K TVs, 8K TVs, one texture at even 8K tends to not be enough. You know, for a high resolution creature, you know, one tile at 8K is not going to be enough. So having more tiles at 4K or even more tiles at 2K will allow you to really spread out that texture resolution over a very large area. Um, and get those fine, you know, skin pores or whatever it is that you're trying to go for and get those in there. Okay, so that's kind of the, the way I think about my UDIMs is just always have something in that first one. And then, you know, I will go out because my grid ends here. I think you can make this grid bigger. I will go out as far as uh, 1010 and then I'll start populating the second line or I'll just keep them in a cluster right in here. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. I've seen people where they have one over here, one over there. Again, I don't recommend the gaps. Just, you know, keep it simple. Keep it, uh, keep it clean. 
Uh, and then when you're done, now this one here, this is the one that I already did. And this one has what, uh, like nine UV uh, U dims or something like that. Uh, this is where everything's the head, the back, you know, the, there's the, 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 you know, different parts of the back and whatnot. So the arms and, and what have you here, hands and so on. Okay, that's just the layout that I picked. You can see that each, each U-DIM, I'm sorry, each shell has a different color. Uh, and it's spread out. Now, if, if I really wanted to go nuts with it, I could have, you know, split them even further and, and, and made, it, made it bigger. But you can see that my arms are split here. This one I actually did not split, which I, I don't think I did on the other one either. The back is split there. You know, the upper chest, so the lower chest is split in half. In fact, the, the lower arms actually connect with the... Uh, Sort of breast and, and stomach area here, which is which is these guys here that worked out all right. Let me see what texel density I'm running at here, eh, 57 or so. So again, the, the the number doesn't work, and this number is dependent on the map size. If this was a 2K map, that would be a different number that would get you the same size. So, you know, uh, maybe if you're in games, that might uh, that number actually means something. But for us, it's just a it's just to get the proportions correct. All right, guys. So. Um, UV mapping is not hard. I actually enjoy it now. I actually like it. Uh, so there we go. Um, I'll show you some of the uh, the, the textured stuff uh, in ZBrush here in a minute. Um, but, you know, if you have any questions or if you've got easier ways to do any of the stuff I just showed you, by all means, put in the comments because I'm, I'm always down to learn. And I don't know what's going on, on my green screen there, but okay. Looks like it's haunted. Uh, but that's okay. I'll fix that here in a second. And we'll go into the second part where we look at some of the texturing uh, things that, that, uh, that I did there. All right. All right. So I'm going to talk really briefly about uh, sort of the texturing process. I'm not going to go into too much detail um, because there's a lot here. But once you have your UVs laid out the way you want them, uh, maximizing the... Um, Textile density and whatnot to your needs, whatever that may be. Um, again, you're also thinking about, you know, what the final resolution is. Obviously, UVs as you're making them are resolution independent. But if you are planning on using 2K maps, then it wouldn't hurt to break things down further <clears throat> than if you're using 4K maps. With this, I plan to use 4K maps. Uh, and it's the kind of thing that if the, you know, if you're, say, using this in an, anima in an animation, and the character was like far away, you could, for that, for that shot, load in lower resolution maps. So you're not necessarily tied to one resolution. Uh, you might have 2K maps for long distance, even 1K maps, depending on how far away from camera it is. And then as you get closer, maybe in a different shot, they're, you know, midway to the camera, they might go up to 2K. And then for the close-ups, you might do 4K. Um, it's all determined by how close the creature in its final form is going to get to the camera. So if we're going to be, you know, if we're going to be like this, close to, to the creature, then I would have definitely have to break this down even further. Uh, because even at 4K, this, you know, you may start to see pixelization or whatever uh, <clears throat> in the map, especially the normal map. So it all depends. Um, so like I said before, this guy actually started out in ZBrush. He didn't start out in Maya. Um, and the reason is, I, you know, I just sort of thought this guy up from, from nowhere. Um, and it's so much easier to do in ZBrush because you're just pushing and pulling. You're not worried about topology and, and getting edge flow right and stuff like that. All that stuff kind of distracts you from the design process. So ZBrush is really nice because you, you, you really don't care about topology at that point because I use Dynamesh, which, uh, which obviously is not the kind of topology you'd want to use for animation, but it allows you to get that design going. Then you can retopologize it later. So. Uh, you know, sculpted in uh, ZBrush, retopologized in ZBrush, brought it into Maya for cleanup, and then UV mapping, and now it's going to go back. These days, you can even do pretty much all of that in ZBrush. You don't even have to come into Maya, but I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. All right, so now we're going to look at uh, what we got here in ZBrush. So as you can see, there's some detail. Again, at 4K, if you come real close, you can see how that's starting to fall apart a little bit. Um, so if I really needed the camera to be able to come into the, you know, this close to the creature, um, you know, rather than go to an 8K map, because 8K UDIMs again can be just ridiculous on the system and, and render times is just astronomical, uh, especially if you want to go more higher than 1080. 
but for you know this kind of distance here this is this is fine for me um a lot of this stuff might actually be able to be hidden by subsurface scattering because it softens the skin so you don't you know you don't see that i only went up to, to uh 10 million uh polygons here uh re realistically i could have gone up one more and get them about 40 41 somewhere in there 40 million and then you probably would have had less of an issue there um so it's not just the map resolution at the end it's also how far you subdivide your mesh uh, 10 million was workable i did try to use geometry hd where it'll subdivide within a certain area at least show you that that part i didn't quite like that workflow so i got rid of that um i could have gone up one more step but this is you know more or less what i came up with here um as, as far as the zbrush paint i wanted sort of darker skin on the top and then lighter skin on the bottom and this actually actually you know um i had to give it a little bit more contrast now for painting i use just a typical standard brush so standard and i'll use uh for pay for painting skin i'll use a color spray spray because it, it hue shifts so with each dot that it puts down it, it's shifted a little bit uh as far as the hue so it, it actually acts like real skin so you can you can kind of see it puts down dots and uh each dot is just slightly off and if you look at human skin there's that variation and if you're using colors that are within the sort of that reddish uh reddish through yellowish uh, human uh, skin uh, values then it, it'll sh it'll hue shift in, in very believable ways um whereas the color i'm sorry just the regular spray uh it value shifts so you get brighter or darker and that doesn't really work for that so definitely using color spray and then also using one of these alphas here to further break it up so i like alpha 7 but i will use alpha 8 i like those shapes that i get in alpha 8 um and you can see you can see that i've used those a bit here to get that um skin blotchiness there some of them are a little little sharp there but uh, i actually take this into substance later and and uh enhance it further so I had sort of the neutral skin tone, which is this sort of reddish brown here. And I actually had a, a less yellow underside, but the contrast wasn't there. It really wasn't popping like I thought it would. I had initially thought I just need basically two colors, so the reddish brown and then something lighter for the underside. Um, and eventually I even darkened it further way up here and on the, on the legs like there. And then lightened, it, lightened the underside. I put more yellow in there to really make it pop. Uh, by the way, this, uh, <clears throat> this material here is the skin shade, which I found late in the game. Usually I'll use the um, fast shader when I'm painting. Just because it is a white shader and you can see the colors. Because if you use something like, you know, like the wax that comes by default, you can see how it completely distorts your colors and, and you don't get the... the you don't get true colors like you would expect. So I typically use fast shader, but at some point, I don't know, I stumble into skin shade and it gives it this nice sort of skin-like gloss to it. Um, <clears throat> so it just it's just a matter of going in. So now the thing that if you're using UDIMS, ZBrush does support UDIMS, but it's not, it's not clean. It's not great like the way, say, Substance does. Um, when you first bring in the thing, you, the, the UVs don't matter because your your poly painting so if we go here to poly paint we're using poly paint and poly paint doesn't care about uvs it paints directly on the polygons and the higher the resolution the better the the higher the um poly count the better the res resolution of your paint so you know again if i'd gone to 40 i might have had an even even uh tighter uh paint job here and then you would then when you export, you would you well, when you finish your paint job, you could then project it down onto the UVs, um, and depending on how you do that, you know there's there's different uh, ways that you can go about that. Uh, under the multi map exporter, you can do texture from poly paint, and if we go in the export options here. So let's see here. If you go to file names. Basically, you're telling it to use uh, the UDIMS. 
if you come in here, I forget what this is by default. I don't know if it's offer or something else. It's one of these, but you set it to UDIM and it'll output to each UDIM separately and name it correctly. So UDIM naming convention is obviously very important. Um, so once you've set that, everything works. Another way that you can um, export the textures if you're not using the multi-map exporter is to under, let's see here, let's go up under geometry. Is it geometry? Let's see. Uh, it's been a while since I used ZBrush. Now, I have forgotten some stuff. One sec. Uh, where is it? <clears throat> Polygroups, my goodness, yeah, there it is. Okay, so if I hit Shift F, you can see that my my polygroups here are going according to the UVs. And the way you do that is just come in here and click uh, UV groups. Okay, your your mesh doesn't have any polygroups by default. If you hit UV groups, it's going to to uh, color them or separate them based on. Uh, let me go down here, based on the actual UV cuts that we made earlier right so that way you can once you have your polygroups if you control shift and click on one of them it'll leave it and then you can paint on that and then you can also export your color map for that particular uh UDIM. and then you can just name them as needed now that's a slow way the fast way of course is to do the uh do the uh where's the z plugin and do a texture from polypay making sure you set the options there okay so um You would go and just do that for each piece so that you know those are the uvs there you know the leg etc etc uh you would go through and export them that way okay <clears throat> so like i said i like zbrush just because the uh the brushes the, the colors excuse me the color spray with say alpha 7 will allow me to let me move my tablet here and of course, I'm at the low level here, so I'm just going to keep hitting D until I get back to my highest level. There it is. So let's let's get a crazy color here, just so you can see what's happening. Let's go with let's go with some purple. How about that? All right. So for example, and I can make a layer. Use layers. Now I don't have any here because I baked them down. I use layers for both sculpting uh, and painting. So. Making sure that your pen, oh, let's set this to RGB, let's turn off the Z add. So you can see that it's going to lay down some color. And the lighter I press, now I'm pressing a lot lighter, and you see that it's bringing it in very slowly. If I press hard, it's just going to over, overdo it. So the, the, uh, the, the trick is to have your... Um, pen sensitivity working so and, and sometimes with these tablets i'm using a huey on here i got a cintiq right next to me but i i like the huey the huey on because my main monitor has got a much higher resolution than the uh than this than the wacom cintiq so you can sort of blend things together like this let me turn off my lazy mouse All right so you can just blend colors over each other and then if because i'm on a layer i can always decrease it if it's if it's going on a little heavy i can always decrease it that way too so i like that you can blend uh, things together now it, it, this is all if I'm using a big brush it's gonna drop much bigger dots so that's one of the downsides here and I'm not sure if there's a way to get around this is that you kind of have to use a small brush and just go paint over the same area multiple times because if I start to press a little hard you know it becomes a little too sharp um, and I can also sample the color if I hit C I can just sample whatever color that was there you'll see it right there and then I can paint over Right, very slowly now I'm, I'm moving a little fast here but uh seemed like it was painting the wrong color for a second there let's go back yeah it's weird so, um not sure why it's doing that but oh i think it's it's the whole layer thing so let's zbrush has its quirks if you've played with ZBrush, you know that ZBrush has its quirks. Um, 
I'm going to go to just make sure that my texture map is invisible, which it isn't. So I'm, I'm just going to paint without the layers for right now. Uh, once you've already baked down some stuff, if you've got layers, then you get those weird artifacts. So right now I'm not, not using layers. So I can start to paint. If I want to say darken here with that same brown, you can see it's getting a little bit darker. Again, I don't want to just go crazy. You see how crazy the uh, hue shifting is. But if you do it real light, and just go back and forth over that area as it darkens, you get a much more natural sort of pigmentation going on. The other thing you can do is if you come in here, go to color spray, right? You can set the flow here and the color, um, how much of that variance you want to be. Usually I'll set this down to 0.1, um, just so that it's not so crazy and how far it jumps among the hues. All right, so I'll, you know, I'll paint with one for a little bit, then I'll just sample a different color. So I'm not painting with the same color, even though it is uh, sort of hue shifting. I like to vary it up because skin is never just one color. There's a lot of variation there. So if, I, if I'm just sort of going back and forth, right, I can just slowly but surely get that all colored in. Okay, so the key here is patience. It will take a long time. Uh, the sculpting too, putting in all this detail. I use alphas for a lot of this. Some of it I sculpted in, like some of these veins I actually drew, I drew myself. I had this, the uh, sculpting turned on, had a slightly green. So let's, let's do that. Uh, we can use either dots or freehand, doesn't really matter. And I used one of these alphas. Let's see, something a little soft like that. Let's just test it real fast, and let's get uh, let's turn on Z add so that it actually sculpts. Okay, that's a little heavy, so let's drop the intensity a little bit. Okay, and I'm just gonna shrink my size down even further, and then we're gonna get some kind of green value, so greenish blue. I don't know something like that, and again. See, that's, that's pretty heavy there. So what I want to do is drop our RGB intensity pretty low. That's a little too low. Okay, so you just got you to try it until you get something that, that makes sense. And I'm going to turn on Lazy Mouse. Uh, shortcut is L. Uh, now I have mine up here because I have a custom interface here, but the way you would do it is just stroke. Turn on Lazy Mouse. And it's up the lazy radius a little bit. So it's going to allow my strokes to be a little uh, a little smoother. So let's drop this. Okay, something like that again. Right, so something like that. You can see how that's popping, but it feels like it's under the skin. And then what I'll do is I'll go back again with the... Uh, uh, the color spray and the alpha and just paint over just to push it back into the skin a little bit uh, and you can get some pretty nice ones. I actually have some alphas for some of these veins but there's ones that I just sort of painted myself and the trick is to look at <clears throat> is to look at veins on say bodybuilders or, or anything like that and see what they look like you don't want to just randomly do it you want to make it feel right um, okay so and that's how I did that And, you know, with a little patience, a little time, eventually you get a completed creature. I haven't finished the eyes there yet. Um, you know, the mouth as well. Right, so let's move it back a little bit. And let's, you know, I'm going to go back to the body and just drop it down so it's not bogging everything down. Go to the tongue. Hit D. Okay, so got some taste buds in there and so on and so forth. Really, ZBrush just allows you to go crazy. You can do and you can see that I got some of the veins in there as well. All right, so it all works pretty well. Doing the color work in here, and then you can take it into substance and, and further work on it. Um, one thing that you also want to... Here, let's go back down. One thing you also want to export is the cavity map. So I'm going to come back up here. And let's, let's take off colorize. Oh, I'm green. 
Okay, so once you have all your details sculpted, what you want to do is just go to... Blah, blah, blah. Well, actually, you can just, to, to export a cavity map, you can go to Z plugin and you can, uh, you know, tell it to do cavity and export a cavity map. Uh, if you want to see what it looks like, you can always go into masking or whatever the hell, there it is. And open here, mask by cavity. I do a mask by cavity at the default setting, see what that looks like. In fact, I don't even think that's a default, that's what I had on there. But you can adjust that value to, to play with that and you can see. What that's gonna allow you to do when you're painting textures is to darken the pores, the, the, the recesses. You wanna darken those up so that the, the light sort of can't penetrate that far. And then I also throw it in the, um, uh, in the specular map so that the pores have no shine to them and just the skin above has the shine. Uh, and, you know, just export this out as just a separate series of images based on the UDIMs. And then I bring everything into Substance. So in here we have now brought it in. I didn't bring in the teeth, the nails, and the eyes and stuff like that because here I'm just working on the body and I have other files for that. Substance files do tend to get really big. So you kind of have to be careful with how much stuff you want to put in your substance file uh, because it will get pretty pretty massive. Now, substance unlike ZBrush, of course, um, you can you can see all the UDIMs and it handles UDIMs way better than ZBrush, uh, which is really nice. So what we're gonna do here is now I want to paint things like your your uh, roughness map and, and specular map and things like that. So what those look like is my roughness is here, right? Where it's black, it's shinier. Um, I was, you know, imagining that this, this thing is just drooling. The, the mouth and nose area is always wet. So all that reflectivity and shininess, you wanna get there. Then we got some sort of drool going down the, the, uh, the neck here. And what that happens here, you can see how we have that, that, that shine coming down the, the neck and the mouth is all shiny. Uh, just helps sell that just nasty uh, feel okay and then over here these little sort of brain protrusions or whatever you want to call them they're pretty dark which means they're also pretty shiny and around the eyes here just want to make this thing kind of slimy kind of nasty and I darkened here notice that I'm at a slightly less dark uh, value here and then all over the back and stuff and then for you know down here it's a little lighter so I don't want the same roughness across the entire creature uh, I want it to vary as it goes down. Really shiny up in here, and then it's, it's a little bit less down here. Um, you know, this is a good representation, but it's not, you know, the final look is gonna depend on the renderer. So even though this kind of looks good as, as, a, as a viewport depiction of it, it's, it's never gonna be accurate. You still gotta take it into Maya and, um, and do some render tests, okay? Um, the other channels, is things like scattering. So this is for my subsurface. This is one of those channels that you've got to add under texture set settings and you hit the plus and you can do scattering. I did specular level and radius. So specular, so scattering here just says where, where it's the whitest is where it's gonna have the most subsurface scattering. So that little neck skin hanging off there, I wanted to be pretty, you know, have that translucency around the, the brains there. And then also, um, the little webbing of the, the, the fingers and things like that. So you could also have used, once you bake your textures, right? If you've seen my previous videos, you know that in Substance, you gotta bake. When you first bring in a model, you gotta come here to bake mesh maps and bake all this stuff down. So if you grab the thickness map, it can work pretty well. There it is right there. Um, I forget how to, here, let's... Let's go to project and where did all of them go? There they are. So just to see what this looks like, I'm gonna go ahead and make a new layer. And we're gonna put this in the color, in the base color. And let's go back on our material here. And why isn't it showing up? So I'm gonna turn off everything else. 
And Substance is thinking now. I can hear my uh, fans going. Oh, you know what? I use the wrong layer. I'm gonna use a fill layer. And then, oh, that was ambient occlusion. Let's go thickness. Base color, and that takes a while to update. So you can see where things are the thinnest. Looks like it's darker. So as it gets thicker, it gets whiter. So you can actually invert this map if we use a levels, is it? And invert, so you can kind of get, so you can, you can use that. I like to paint my own, so I didn't do that. Um, let's go back here. Turn all these on. Not that one. Okay, so I use mine. I, I, you know, determine where I want it to be a little bit more translucent. Um, you know, I could have been a little bit neater with it, but it didn't really need it. <clears throat> Then the other one is specular level, and this is where I use my um, uh, cavity map because I want, so specularity just says where there's specularity and where there isn't specular level. So in the pores, I didn't want anything, so it's pretty dark. And then above that, you want, and then obviously in the, uh, around the mouth head area, I gave it full white. Then the other one is, I got a scattering, normal, let's go. Radius. So the radius is the color when you shine a light through an object, like through the ear. You see I, it gets all red. Well, that's kind of the radius color. So for the main body, I gave it red. Now I could go in and, and work this map some more. And then on the underside, I gave it the yellow because I had given it a yellow tint. Uh, it makes a tiny bit of difference. And it was, you know, it took me like two, two seconds to make this map. It's, it's just solid colors, really. So you know, worth it for me, but it may not be for you. So those are some of the custom ones that I made there. Um, and when you combine it all, uh, <clears throat> it gives you the final thing, which again, this is, this is a decent approximation, but it's not exactly accurate. You'd have to take it into Maya to do some renders. Okay. So again, you know, this all, you, you kind of have to plan all this stuff starting in the modeling stage. Before you start, you know, at least when you get to re retopology, you got to know where those UV seams are, are going to be, making sure you lay them in, just so that you can get a nice mesh that unfolds really nice. Okay, so um, this turned into a little bit longer video than I was uh, planning, uh, but that's, that's the, the uh, basic workflow there. Um, I will do a, a more complete video on this, so some of this might be repeated later, but not a big deal. Um, let me see if I can find some renders for you. Okay, so here's here's a, a couple renders here of it. And there's one here. So you can see how this turned out pretty well, I would say. And you test it under different lighting conditions. So see, this is after it's rigged, and I, and the, I can move the tongue around. This is just another sort of basic render. So, you know, don't be afraid of UV mapping. It's fine. They've made it better in Maya. So, you know, have fun with the with the HDRs and, you know, pose a character if you want to pose a character. Um... But yeah, guys, if you have any questions or anything like that, by all means, uh, put them down in the comments below, and um, I'll see what I can do to answer them. Uh, if you like the content, guys, please uh, don't forget to uh, like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that bell for notifications. And um, we'll keep putting out these videos, even if it does take a while. All right, guys, hope you uh, enjoyed this one. We'll see you in the next one.